Amen. Amen. Good to see everybody this morning. Let me ask you to take a Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 4. And as you turn there this morning, um, let me say a word of thanks to Gavin, our pastor of student ministry, who preached last Sunday while I was on vacation. And I know he did a great job and uh, preached about God's grace, which is always what we need to hear. And so I'm so thankful for him and him bringing the word to us last week as a church. Um, Today we're going to look at uh, Matthew chapter 4. Next week we'll pick right back up in our series on Colossians, and uh, we'll begin to move into uh, the last couple of chapters of Colossians uh, as we get into that. This morning what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about our lives as we turn the calendar uh, from 2020 to 2021. Um, At this time of the year, everybody starts making New New Year's resolutions and all those things. And and what I want to do is I want to talk to us about how we live out uh, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And we have a mission statement as a church that we're all very familiar with if you've been around here for any length of time. And our mission statement is that River Valley Church exists to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus who love one another and impact the world with the gospel. Now, when we say that we exist to glorify God, that means that none of us as individuals nor us as a church exists for ourselves. We don't exist for ourself, for our own purposes. We exist for God and for his purposes. And his purpose for our life is that we would glorify him. And the way that we do that is through the gospel. It's through the fact that we have been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And because of that, we become disciples of Jesus. And a disciple of Jesus is one who's with Jesus, learning from Jesus how to be like Jesus. And so this morning... I want us to take a look at Jesus, one instance in his life, and learn from him by being with him this morning what it means for us to be like him, to be disciples of Christ. So I want to read to you from Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Matthew 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and after fasting... Forty days and forty nights he was hungry, and the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is God's word to us. Let's pray. Father, this morning we ask that you would bless us with an awareness of what it means for us to live our lives faithful to the truth of the gospel as disciples of Jesus. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears, and Lord, grant us repentance to turn from lives lived for ourselves and give us faith to trust in Jesus as we live our lives for him. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. All right, so looking at Matthew 4, here's what I want to do. I want to draw your attention to a number of things. First thing I want you to see when you look at Matthew 4 is I want you to see that Jesus had a physical body. Now, I know we're in the season of Christmas. We're talking about the incarnation, that God became human flesh in the person of Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God. He becomes uh, flesh. He lives among us as one of us. It's important to realize that Jesus was fully human. He's absolutely fully human. He's not uh, appearing to be human. He is human. And one of the things that is true of every human is that every human gets hungry. That's the first thing you see there. I mean, humanity is characterized by our hunger. We hunger. Our bodies need food. And when you look at this, look at what it says. It says that man shall not live by bread alone. Now, it doesn't say that man shall not live by bread. It says man shall not live by bread alone. In other words, our lives are more than our physical bodies, but they are not less than our physical bodies. And so when we look at our lives, we have to understand that as Christians, we are not Gnostic. 
Gnostic uh, means that when we talk about Gnosticism, this was an ancient heresy that believed that matter was bad and spirit was good. And so therefore, your physical body was not good. And so when Christ came, Christ came to liberate us from our bad physical material body so that we could go away to heaven and live true lives in our spiritual body. So we need to remember that we are physical beings. And so when we talk about our lives, it's appropriate that we understand that we are physical people. We are people in human bodies. The church condemned Gnosticism years ago as heresy. It's just heretical. So you can't believe that your body is irrelevant and be anything other than a heretic. Now when you look at this though, notice that Jesus was not just fully human, but Jesus also is perfectly human. And he's perfectly human in the sense that he demonstrates to us that being completely faithful to God is what it means to be perfectly human. We're meant to live lives of faithful obedience. So Jesus doesn't say that our physical bodies are not important and they don't matter and therefore neglecting our physical bodies demonstrates some sort of higher spiritual life. He doesn't say that at all. In fact, he's not saying that our bodies don't matter, but rather he's saying this, to satisfy the desires of our physical bodies by neglecting God and his word is sin. That's what it means to say that we don't live by bread alone. We're not to be just concerned with our physical life. So Jesus is saying our physical bodies do matter, and because they do matter, what we do with our bodies does matter. We can't just treat them as if they're irrelevant. So neglecting the desire of our physical body in order to be faithful to God and his word, that's what genuine humanity and genuine spirituality looks like. So the biblical view of the body is much higher than most of us put on our understand, or where we place our emphasis on the body. So I want to draw your attention to just three things that scripture says about the body. It says a lot about the body, but I'm going to show you three things. So here's three examples. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 with me. Let me show you this. First thing I want you to see beginning in verse 12 is this. A Christian's body, your physical body, it belongs to the Lord. Your body belongs to the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 12 says this. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body, underline that, the body is not meant for sexual immorality. In other words, you don't just get to do what you want with your body. But instead, the body is not meant for that. But here's what the body is meant for. But for the Lord. The body is meant for the Lord. Because our bodies belong to the Lord. And the Lord for the body. Second thing, if you drop down to verse 15, I want to show you that a Christian's body is actually a member of Christ. You are part of Christ in your body. 1 Corinthians 6.15, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Not at all, never. The third thing, a Christian's body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. That is a verse that you need to underline, tattoo on your face. This is an important verse, all right? You are not your own. For you were bought with a price. The cross purchases you. You now belong to Christ. You're not your own. You were bought by him. You were his possession. So, because of that, glorify God in your body. It doesn't just say in your spiritual life. And this is, the where, this is where Christians go off track. We wind up sounding like Gnostics, like heretics. And we say, what I do with my body doesn't matter because my body's just going to be left behind and my spirit's going to be with the Lord. No, your body belongs to the Lord. Glorify God in your body. So lie to this. Let's just draw some conclusions from that. Number one, we are not free to change our bodies. I know our, our culture thinks we can do whatever we want with our bodies. 
but our bodies belong to the Lord. He gave them to us. We don't get to just change them. The state, the condition he gave them to us in is the condition and the state he intended us to live in them in. No matter what we may think mentally or emotionally about that, this is who we are. Second, we're not free to sin with our bodies. Why? Because they're members of Christ. So you can't take your body and just go use it for sin. Either sin that happens to you, with you, within you, no matter what. And third, we're not free to mistreat our bodies because they're temples of the Holy Spirit. So this is the first thing that we learn about what we see here in Jesus in his humanity is that we understand that in his humanity there's a positive statement that humanity is good. Christ didn't come just to liberate us from it but that we're meant to live in our bodies and that's why the rest of the New Testament tells us that. But the second thing I want you to see, the first thing is is that Jesus has a body, but the second thing I want you to see is that Jesus is faithful in his physical body. It's in his physical body that he's faithful. So look at what happens when you look back at verse number one. It says that Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So I told you that Jesus was faithful in his physical body. So let me draw a number of things out of that. Number one, first, look, Jesus went where the Spirit led him in his body. He went wherever he was led by the Spirit, didn't matter where it was. He went even if it was not enjoyable for his physical body. Now, I want you to just consider that for a moment. Jesus went where the Spirit led him, even if it wasn't enjoyable for his physical body. It says Jesus was led up into where? The wilderness. I know you're all writing. This is good students. All right. Jesus was led into the wilderness. Does anything about that sound wonderful? Hey, Jesus, you're going to go live for 40 days in the wilderness with no food. I, I don't want to do that. All right? I don't want, I, if, if someone today said, do you want to go live out in the parking lot for the next 40 days? It's not even the wilderness, it's the parking lot. I don't want to do that. All right? Jesus is led into the wilderness for 40 days. This is not enjoyable, but why does he go there? It's right there. Jesus was led by the Spirit. The Spirit leads him to a place that's unenjoyable for his body. That's what physical faithfulness looks like. You go even if your body's not going to receive pleasure from it. All right? Second, Jesus went where the Spirit led him, even if it required discipline over his physical body. Notice the text again. He was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He knew where he was led was going to be into a place of temptation, which means that he was going to have to have discipline to withstand the temptation. So Jesus is modeling for us genuine humanity by saying what is enjoyable to the body doesn't necessarily equate to being right with God. And what is, uh, it, it, what's requiring hardship and discipline, this is what true humanity looks like. It means being disciplined over my body, which the Lord has given me. The third thing you see is that Jesus went where the Spirit led him, even if it was dangerous for his physical body. I've talked a lot lately about our over-obsession with safety, physical safety. Jesus goes where it's dangerous. Notice it says that he's going to be tempted by who? By the devil. Nothing about being with the devil sounds like a safe place to be. In fact, it sounds as a more, it, it, the being with the devil sounds like being in a more dangerous position than just being in a room filled with sick people. So Jesus goes to a place where it's going to be dangerous. Notice the fourth thing. He goes to a place even if it's uncomfortable for his physical body. It says after fasting 40 days and 40 nights. That doesn't sound like a place of comfort. It says that he was hungry. That means his body was uncomfortable. All of this is what faithfulness in a physical body looks like. It looks like disciplining your body with its desires for pleasure, freedom, comfort, and safety. You say no to it. You, you take ownership over it. This is why, going back to 1 Corinthians, says we're not to be dominated by anything. We're to have mastery over everything. You say, well, how will I do that? Well, it will require self-control. But for those who are in Christ, you will have the Holy Spirit because you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, which dwells in you, and the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So you'll be manifesting that fruit. And so this is what physical faithfulness looks like. It looks like surrendering your body to the Lord for his use, for his purpose. All right, now I want to draw your attention to the third thing. 
The third thing is that Jesus, so first thing is Jesus has a physical body. Second thing is, is he's faithful in his physical body. But the third thing is, and this is the key to how we're going to get into all this then, is that Jesus was spiritually nourished in his physical body. He was watering the tree, so to speak. If I said that our tree, all right, is, is going to produce the fruit, and the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. In fact, it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, blah, 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 all right. Well, I know the rest of it. I'm just going to cut to the chase, right? So Jesus is spiritually nourished. The reason that Jesus is able to live with faithfulness in his physical body is because he knew that spiritual nourishment of his physical body was no less important than physical nourishment. I mean, I, most of us, you know, it, it goes a little bit beyond what is normal for lunchtime, and we start really getting antsy. Oh, man, I'm just starving. Our blood sugar crashes. I mean, listen, if we understand that when we don't eat appropriately, that our blood sugar crashes and bad things go on and we, we go into some sort of, you know, we become hangry, right? If that happens to us, then why would we not assume that we wouldn't have spiritual crashes when we're not spiritually nourishing our body appropriately? And so this becomes an important thing for us to understand. Look at verse 3. The tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So notice, yes, man lives by bread. It's important. But man does not live by bread alone. See the word alone? Why? Because we're more than our bodies. We don't live by bread alone. Man shall also live by what? By every word that comes from the mouth of God. Why? Because we're more than our bodies bodies. So where I want to settle in here then for a while is examining Jesus' relationship to every word that comes from the mouth of God. The way we would say that is, I want to examine Jesus' relationship to Scripture. What does it look like? Well, here we go. First of all, notice that he answers and says, it is written. See him say that? It is written. That's scripture that Jesus is quoting. Now he's going to go on from that. He's going to immediately say what is written. So the first thing we see is this. Jesus knew what scripture said. All right, I want you to write that down. Jesus knew what scripture said. This is really important. Jesus says, it is written. It is written. It's not as simple as saying then that Jesus knew scripture in his omniscience as God, which is what we want to do. We want to step back and say, well, but, you know, but of course Jesus knew what scripture said because like Jesus is God, so it's like his words. We want to say that, but it's not that simple because Jesus is functioning faithfully in his physical body, which means that he knows what scripture said, not in his omniscience as God, but in his mind in his memory as man. Now let me show you. Luke chapter 2, verse 40. It says this, the child grew, this is Jesus, he's a child and he's growing, and the child grew and he became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. So as Jesus is growing up, his mind is becoming filled with wisdom. He's growing and becoming strong, his body is growing, his mind is growing, this is happening to Jesus. Jesus has devoted himself to reading, to studying, and to meditating on scripture. And then at the end of that section, we come back to a verse at the end of chapter 2 in verse 52 that looks the same way. And Jesus, look at this, increased in wisdom. See, you can't say that Jesus just showed up and had all the wisdom in the world. Don't imagine Jesus as a two-year-old watching his father, Joseph, his earthly dad, trying to build something. And Jesus, the two-year-old, is looking at him and saying, that's the wrong piece of wood for this table. He didn't function that way. Jesus isn't floating around as a little golden child Messiah. Jesus isn't like that. Jesus is fully man. To be fully man means that he lives his physical life in this body, and that's why it says that he increased in wisdom. God, in his pure deity, never increases in knowledge. He has all the knowledge of all things at all times. But in his humanity, Jesus is increasing in wisdom. How is he increasing in wisdom? He's 
an increasing in wisdom because he's learning the scripture. He's meditating on the scripture. He is studying the scripture. He knows what scripture says. So he's increasing in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with man. Now, here's the thing you have to understand. In Jesus' day, people didn't have Bibles in their homes. They didn't have Bibles in their homes where the families didn't have personal copies of the Old Testament bound in goatskin hanging out in their house. They didn't have that. Instead, they had to learn Scripture a different way. How did they learn Scripture? Well, the first way that people learn Scripture is their moms and dads. Their moms and dads told them the stories. They told them the story of the Exodus. They told them what God's law said. They wrote the law in, over, the, over the doorpost of their house. I mean, these people, everywhere they went, they knew what Scripture was because the people of God were constantly hearing God's word throughout the time of their childhood development all the way up into the time in which they became adults and they began to pass it on to their own kids. So the first place that they were learning Scripture was in their homes. Their moms and dads were teaching it to them. The second way they were learning scripture is, is they were going to the synagogue. And it was there in the synagogue that someone unrolled the scroll and they read the scroll to them and the people heard it and now they knew what it said. And then, furthermore, they were learning it as they were being taught it by the rabbis. And some people then would study with the rabbis. And in studying with the rabbis, they would become experts in it. This is how Jesus knew the scriptures. He didn't have a little pocket copy of the Psalms tucked away in the back pocket of his first century robe. Jesus knew scripture because his mom and his dad told him what scripture said. And then he went to the synagogue and he heard it read. And then he had rabbis who taught it to him. This is the same way that we understand the scriptures today. The same way that we understand the scriptures. But we do have Bibles in our homes, and since we do have Bibles in our homes, multiple copies, multiple translations in English, complete with study notes galore and application commentary galore, we have all this stuff, it takes us less effort to know the Bible than it took for Jesus to know the Bible. Can you imagine that? It takes us less effort to know the Bible than it took for Jesus to know the Bible. Again, Move away from this idea that, well, he's just God, so he knew it. No, that's not the way it works. For him to be fully human means that he had to be fully human, which means he had to learn. So he had to grow and learn. So this means that we need to be able to say, like Jesus, when faced with something in our life, hey, this is what's written. But we can't say that. And the reason we oftentimes can't say that is because we don't know what's written because we don't know what Scripture says Jesus didn't have this. He devoted himself to it. And look at what we find in Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. See, Jesus could say that without lying. Can we say that without lying? Can we say, oh, how I love your law? Do we genuinely love God's word? Do we meditate on it all day long? All day long doesn't mean you just sit in some like trance you know, in front of your fireplace, just staring, meditating, and you don't go to work and you don't do anything to socialize with others, it means that you take it with you. You need to think of, I want you to begin to think of, of your, when you sit with the Lord in the morning and read your Bible, at the end of your time spent with the Lord every day, I want you to hold on to this visual image in your mind for the rest of 2021. I want you to think, when I'm done reading my Bible every morning, I want to take one verse of scripture that just jumped off the page that the, the Holy Spirit apprehended me with this verse. And I want to see my Bible like it was a pack of chewing gum. And I'm taking that piece of chewing gum, that verse that jumped off the page, and I'm going to walk around. I'm going to chew that gum all day long until all the flavor is out of it. See, that's what you do when you meditate on scripture all day long. In Psalm 119, verse 11, it says this, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Jesus' temptation in the wilderness is the ultimate real-life example of this verse. I mean, every time he's tempted, what does he do? He quotes God's word. It came from his heart. He didn't sin. Can we do the same thing? Can you do the same thing? If you're faced with temptation, if you're faced with fear, with worry, with, with, uh, with any sort of temptation towards covetousness or, or lust or any of those things, it, to, to, to spout off an anger, can you in that moment 
find that God's word has so filled your heart that it overflows out of your heart, out of the heart, all right, is what we find flowing out of our mouths. So the first thing we notice about Jesus then is this, he knew what scripture said. Jesus knew what scripture said. Here's the second thing, not only know what it said, but he understood what scripture meant. So Jesus knew what scripture said, but he also understood what it meant. Let me show you this. What is he quoting here? He's quoting something in Matthew 4.4 4 when he says, man shall not live. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. But why is he quoting that? Why of all the things that Jesus knew that were written, why is it that when tempted in the wilderness after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, this is the one that he draws up? Why is this the one? He knows what the scripture says, so why this one? Because he understands what the scripture means. So let me show you this in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Now this is in the midst of the wilderness wandering, right? The, the time of wilderness wandering, 40 years in the wilderness for Israel has come to an end. Israel's been delivered out of Egypt. They've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years because they sinned when they were unwilling to trust God and go into the promised land. And now the time has approached to go into the promised land and there's a recounting of all the happened in the 40 years prior. Now watch what happens. Deuteronomy 8. The whole commandment, the whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God, watch this, has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. Notice, God has led you 40 years in the wilderness. Now in Matthew 4, what's happened? God has led Jesus for 40 days in the wilderness. This is what's happening here. Why did he lead them? Watch, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart. Now Jesus was tested in the wilderness in Matthew 4. And what was in his heart? God's word was in his heart. Specifically, this very passage was in his heart. Whether you would keep his commandments or not. Isn't this what Jesus is being tempted with? Are you going to keep the commandment, Jesus, or not? Isn't this what Israel was tempted with? Whether they will keep the commandments or not. Verse 3. And he humbled you, and he let you hunger, and he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know. He did this so that you would know something. Remember, God fed Israel with manna in the wilderness. Every morning they would wake up and they would go out and there would be a white flaky substance that covered the ground and they would gather it up and they would eat it and it was just enough for that day. If they tried to keep extra, it would spoil and go rotten and bad and worms would be in it. And so they didn't have any more than what they needed for that particular day. Why did he do this? Because he wanted them to learn something. What did he want them to learn in the desert for those 40 years? Here it is. Verse 3, that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. There it is. That's what Jesus is quoting during his 40 years or his 40 day period of testing in the wilderness. He's quoting that exact verse. So notice, Jesus, watch this, Jesus could quote that verse because he knew what scripture said. But he did quote that verse because he understood what scripture meant. That's why he does quote it. Manna was what Israel ate for 40 years in the wilderness. And they didn't provide it for themselves. They didn't make it. It wasn't made by human hands. Instead, manna came directly from God. It came straight from him. In fact, how did it come straight from him? Well, God commanded manna to appear. And so watch, if God commanded manna to appear, then we could say that manna came from the mouth of God. It was by God's word in which he said, appear, that manna appeared. And so literally manna appears because God commands it to appear, which means that when we see this, it means that literally Israel lived by every word that came from the mouth of God. This is how they lived. So Jesus quotes this passage here in the wilderness because he knew what it said. He knew that Deuteronomy said this. 
about their time in the, Israel, in the wilderness, and he understood what it meant. It meant that God's word is, is that which sustains us physically and spiritually. So like Jesus, then we too have to what? Know what scripture says, and we have to understand what scripture means. But then there's a third thing, and the third thing is this. Jesus obeyed what scripture required. Jesus obeyed what scripture required. Scripture requires absolute obedience. Why? Because it's the word of God. And so it requires absolute obedience. So it's not enough to know what it says. It's not enough to know what it, to understand what it means. That's wonderful. If you know what it says and you understand what it means, wonderful. But you're not there yet. You have to be willing to obey what it requires. That's the hard part, isn't it? So Adam and Eve, what happens to them in the garden? Adam and Eve are in the garden, and what do they hear? Well, they hear God's word. And when they hear God's word, though, we realize that it's not enough. And the reason it's not enough, because listen, Adam and Eve, they hear God's word, so they know what God's word says. God's word says this, if you eat this tree, you will die. Now they understand what that means. We're not supposed to do it. But what do they not do? They don't obey what the word requires. And what happens? They die. That's what happens. Man shall live by what? Not bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Do they live by every word that comes from the mouth of God? Nope. Do they live? Nope. Do they die? Yes. Why? Because they didn't pay attention to every word that comes from the mouth of God. We find ourselves in the wilderness. Israel. What's Ild- what, what is Israel to do? Israel is to listen to what God says. What does God say? God says, go into the land. I'll defeat all the enemies, and I'll give you the land. They hear that, they say, well, we know he said that he's promised us this land. In fact, he promised it to our ancestors. We knew this back in Egypt. It's why we didn't feel like we should be in Egypt. We didn't feel like we should be in Egypt because we knew we weren't supposed to be in Egypt. We were supposed to be in the land God had promised us. Now they come to the edge of the land. God says, go into the land. I'll conquer all the enemies, and I'll give you the land. They heard that. They knew what he said. They understood what it meant. Did they do what was required? Nope. And what happened? The whole generation of those who refused to go into the land, they all died in the wilderness. You see, man shall live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. To know what God says, to understand what he says, and to not obey what he requires is not to live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now watch this carefully. Back in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Now, you may want to just underline those words. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Jesus heard right then on the spot, he heard exactly what God said. What did God say? This is my beloved son. Then, chapter 4, verse 1, then Right after hearing these words, the minute he hears these words, this is my son. Then Jesus was led up into the wilderness by the spirit to be tempted by the devil. Now we enter into the text we began with. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter, that's Satan, came to him and said, watch, if you are the son of God. Notice that phrase. If you. You are the son of God. What had God said? You are the son. What does the tempter say? If you're the son, if you're the son. Jesus hears these words from the, from the temper. If you're the son of God. And the minute he hears them, he measures them against God's words. Wait a minute. He's tempting me with this, but that doesn't sound like what God has said here. So he measures these words. He says, hmm. I know what God has said. God has said, I'm his beloved son. If God has said, I'm his beloved son, then why do I need to pay attention to what he says when he asks me if I am the beloved son and then demands that I prove it? Why do I have to prove it? God's already said it. If God has said it, I don't have to prove it. 
I don't have to prove anything at all. What does he tell them to do? He says, command these stones. Command these stones to become bread. Notice he doesn't say, if you're hungry, command the stones. He challenges them with what God has said. If you're the son of God, then command the stones to become bread. He hits him right in the place where Jesus is feeling the hunger, and he challenges him right there. But not only had God said this is his beloved son, but what had God also said? God had also said, what? This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. You know what that meant? That meant Jesus didn't need to prove himself to Satan. He didn't have to prove himself to Satan because he already knew that he was the son of the father and the father was well pleased with him. We, when we don't understand that we are children of the father because of our redemption and that the father is already pleased with us, then we don't have to go out and prove ourselves to anyone. But he answered, verse 4, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, I know what God has said, Satan. I understand what he means, Satan. And I am going to obey him, Satan. That might have worked on Adam and Eve. That might have worked on Israel in the wilderness. But it's not going to work on me because I know what God has said, I understand what he means, and I'm going to obey what he requires. In the rest of the passage, which we're not going to look at, down through verse 11, Satan repeatedly attempts to twist God's word, just as he did with Adam and Eve. He kind of quotes half of it, takes it out of context, just rips the verse out. I like this verse for this moment. Jesus remains faithful to all those ripped out of context verse, in, in spite of all those ripped out of, verse, out of context verses, because he knows what God has said. And he understands that he as a man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Not just some of the words, which the tempter will be happy to give to you, but all the words. So let's put all that together. Here's what you see. First thing you see about Jesus is this. Because and why, why, do we, why do we need to hold all this together and put this together? And why do we need to think about this this morning? Because as you begin a new year, you begin a new year not belonging to yourself. You begin a new year belonging to the Lord. You belonged to the Lord last year. You belong to the Lord this year. You live through this year in 2022, you're going to belong to the Lord. You belong to the Lord. And so as one who belongs to the Lord, your life is intended to glorify God. It's your whole reason for existing. And you're to do that by being a disciple of Jesus, which means you're to look at Jesus and say, how do I learn from Jesus how to be like Jesus? Well, what do we see? We see, first of all, that Jesus has a physical body. Now, you know why this is such great news for us, that Jesus has a physical body? Because if Jesus was just the super spirit that came to liberate all of us from our physical bodies to where one day we could get on with real life when we're just spirits disembodied from this nasty carnal flesh, well, then We'd have a hard time trying to understand how to live faithfully in this world because we live in physical bodies. But Jesus can live in a physical body like us, which means that we can say to Jesus, Jesus, I know that you were like me in a body filled with hunger and pain and fear and sadness and temptation. And I can look to you and genuinely learn from you how to be like you because you were like me, a human. And so Jesus had a physical body and he was faithful in his physical body. He didn't just cast aside all of the things that come with living in a physical body and say, you know, none of this is really important. It doesn't matter what I eat, what I drink. It doesn't, none of that matters. What really matters is just the liberation of my spirit in some sort of bizarre oneness weirdo Eastern mysticism. Instead, what does he do? He spiritually nourishes himself so that he can live faithfully in his body, in other words, so he can live faithfully in his human existence in this world. And how does he do this? Well, he do, does this very simply. He does it by knowing scripture, he does it by understanding scripture, and he does it by obeying scripture. That's the key to the whole thing. And the culmination of all this is the cross. Because Jesus knew what scripture said, 
because he understood what it meant. He was willing to obey what it required, which is that he is the Messiah, goes to the cross. And in going to the cross, he does this because he's willing to bring lack of comfort to his physical body in dying for our sins because spiritually he was nourished enough to understand that this was the route that God had laid out for him. You see, the path to the cross is the path of Jesus. So, as a church, we exist to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus. That's our calling. And a disciple of Jesus is one who is what? Learning from Jesus how to be like Jesus. So in light of this passage, I want to challenge us then in 2021, all right? If you didn't have any New Year's resolutions, it's all right. I got them for you, okay? And if you had your own and they didn't have these in it, then add these, okay? Here it is. It's real simple, all right? Number one. I just want to encourage you this year to be faithful in your physical body. Be faithful in your body. You know, God has given you your body, and it belongs to him. So you need to be a good steward of your body. you got to be a good steward of it. So this means you, you got to pay attention to what you eat. Some of you need to pay attention to what you eat. You need to exercise, and you need to sleep well. Uh, some of you are saying, like, hey... I, I come here for you to talk to me about Jesus, not about what I do with my body. Ha, you just need to rewind 45 minutes. See, our bodies belong to the Lord. We have to take care of them. So some of you, the, the best thing you can do this year is get some extra sleep. All right? You just say, I, I'm exhausted. You know what happens when you're exhausted? Well, when you're exhausted, you cave into temptation because you're too tired to fight the battle. So you just need to get some extra sleep this year. Did you, some of you have no, never b would have dreamed that getting extra sleep this year would mean that you were being faithful to Christ. But it is. He gave you that body. It's the only body you get. You're not getting another one, all right? Now, we may come up with some weird, you know, biogenic, you know, stuff from the future and try to grow you a new body one day or something, but that's ridiculous, all right? We are intended to live in the bodies that the Lord has given us. So some of us this year just need to make some better decisions about what we do with our bodies. God has given your body. It's a member of Christ. Therefore, don't sin in your body. That means don't sin with your words. Don't sin with your actions. You see, sinning with words is sinning with your body because it took your tongue to do some up and down movement with some breath coming out of your lungs, rattling off your vocal cords to be able to say some of the hateful things that you say to people. You can't do that. That's not being faithful with your body. Being faithful with your body means not being a person who sins with your tongue. It also means being a person who doesn't sin with your actions. You cannot act upon anything unless you do it with your body. So be faithful with the body God has given you. God's given you a body. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. So don't mistreat your body. You know, the fascinating thing, watch this. I'll just say it this way. If you're sitting in a chair, and this, will be, this is like our first thing to do with our body today. We're going to do an ab exercise. Just pick your feet up off the ground, both feet. Now, why do I want you to do that? Not to exercise your abs because I'm going to step on your toes, all right? Here's what I mean when I say don't mistreat your body. You know what's amazing to me? I've been really fascinated by something. And listen, and believe me, I promise you, I'm not picking on masks or any of that stuff, okay? So just I'm not doing that, all right? I just said it. So before later, he was like, I just said it. I'm not picking on masks. I just want to say this. It's fascinating to me that a bunch of people who for, you know, in, in our country, who for the last 25 years have cared nothing about their health and what they put into their body, suddenly want to put masks on to stop something from coming into their body. Now, I don't know whether or not you'll get coronavirus from wearing a mask or not, but I do know that some of the things that you put in the body are going to lead to heart disease. So, all right, you can put your feet back down. Shake them out, all right? Isn't it funny? Pastors can preach on just about anything in the world. And then we're told pastors can preach on anything except for money. Well, that's not true. You preach on gluttony and watch what happens. They'd rather just give you, I'll pay you to just shut up about that, right? <laughs> this is the way it works, all right? 2021, isn't it better already? You yeah. know? All right. Lastly, okay. First thing, this year, I want you to be faithful with your physical body. I, let me restate that. God wants you to be faithful with your physical body. It doesn't matter what I want. God wants you to be faithful with your body, okay? The second thing is this. This year, I want you to just commit to be spiritually nourished. 
all right? Take care of your spiritual health, take care of your physical health. Be spiritually nourished. So how do we do that? Well, I already told you, you're spiritually nourished by knowing what scripture says, understanding what it means, obeying what it requires, right? So what does scripture say? Well, guess what? We've created a wonderful plan for you this year, all right? To know what scripture says. So on your chair, when you came in, you were given the 2021 Bible reading plan. This is what we're going to do together as a church. So this is our nutrition plan, spiritually, all right? In the beginning, there's a bunch of stuff I wrote to tell you why you should do this. And in the get through about three pages of it, and then boom, there it is. Week one starts January 4th. That's tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, we're all waking up with the new and improved us, right? No, tomorrow morning, we're going to wake up, and it's time to get on with our lives for the year, all right? It's time to move on. Man, you know what? God was, has been so faithful to us in 2020. I mean, let's not believe all this nonsense that, like, 2020 is horrible and we just should throw it away. 2020 is not a waste. God gave us life. He gave us breath. He gave us grace. You're here. You're, you're worshiping Christ this morning. Jesus has guaranteed that if you die, you'll go to be with him in heaven forever. This, God has given us so much grace, and it's wonderful. We have a church. We're meeting. We're, we're together it's wonderful. So let's take this year then and say, you know, 2020 was a year where for many of you, you read the Bible more consistently than you've ever read in your life because we moved our Bible reading plan into our community groups. And it was wonderful. That means that for many of you, when you look back and say, I don't know what to make of 2020. Well, I got one question. Did you consistently read your Bible in 2020 more than you ever have before because of our plan to read it in community groups? If the answer is yes, then 2020 was the best year of your life, not the worst, because you read God's word, because you knew God in a way you didn't before. So give thanks to him, right? Look at your Bible, love it, cherish it, weep over it, cry over it. You ought to have tear stains in your Bible. This is why you need to have a Bible, you know, not just a, a phone. Um, so we're going to read the Bible. This is how you know what it says, okay? So this year, you say, wait a minute, there's a little bit more reading than last year. Ah, it's because your stomach expanded in the last year when you were doing the other plan, okay? So you're going to read the Bible, all right? Know what Scripture says. And then not only do you know what it says, well, then you got to understand what it means. You say, well, how? I have a hard time understanding what it means. Listen. That's why we got this part two of this, which is what? Just, you got to be in a community group, right? Because what happens in a community group? You talk about it. You discuss it. So to understand what scripture means, jump into a community group. Read it with other people. Talk about it with other people. Let it work into your life. Not only that, come to church regularly. Listen to sermons regularly. Some of you, some of you should open the front of your Bible, write a note that says, I will not miss one of the 52 sermons that are going to be preached in my church this year. Just write that down. Make that a resolution. I mean, we, we get resolved about all kinds of things. How about resolve for that? It's, here's the thing. If, if you do that, I can promise you at least this. You'll not only know what Colossians says, you'll understand what Colossians means, all right? Because I preach like one word a week from the book. And so we'll just go through it together, all right? You'll know what it means. And then finally, you got to obey what Scripture requires, right? you got to do what Scripture says. This is another reason you need to be in a community group. You need to be in a community group because there's accountability, all right? Because when you're sitting in a community group and you say in your community group, you know, and watch how this happens. This week, I was reading the Bible, and you know what? The, it, it said this, and I'm pretty sure that it means this. And other people in your community say, yeah, that's exactly what it means. You say, yeah, and I think... I was really convicted that God wants me to this. Then your community group says, oh, that's wonderful. I think you should do that because that's what scripture says and it's what it means. You say, yeah, you're right, I should do that. And then you come back to your community group the next time you meet and they say, hey, did you do that? Well, now see there's accountability. Now you're gonna have to be held accountable to whether or not you, require, you obeyed what scripture required of you. So be in a community group where you read the Bible together, where you understand the Bible together, and where you obey the Bible together, all right? So this is very simple this morning, all right? This is just, a, it, this is meat and potatoes, all right? This is not anything gourmet. This is as simple as it gets. But here's the thing. We don't live off gourmet meals. We live off of the simple things that we eat every day of our life, right? Every once in a while, you know, th this, this past week uh, was... I don't know what day it is anymore, all right? Uh, 
this past week, Wednesday, okay, Wednesday was the 30th. That was my anniversary, all right? Leslie and I have been married for 25 years. And on our anniversary, you know, we went out and we had a wonderful, great meal. Not the kind of meal that we're going to have this coming Wednesday, all right? This coming Wednesday, it's probably going to be tacos, all right? But we live off tacos, okay? Not off of rich meals that we eat on special occasions. This is all very simple stuff, guys, but this is what we live on. Not bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God, all right? Okay, everybody good? You got your Bible reading plan? You ready to go? Can't wait to read it? Next week, you're going to come in, and you're going to be all excited because you're going to have read all the way through Genesis chapter 15 and Mark chapter 5, and you're going to be like, wow, man, I'm fired up. I'm ready to go, all right? If you're not in a community group today, you need to get in one. You say, how do I get in one? That's okay. When you're done here, you're just going to walk right back outside to the Welcome Center, and right there at the Welcome Desk, there's going to be people standing right there. Steve, our executive pastor, and others that are going to be able to tell you, hey, you want to be in a community group? We'll put you in one. If you're not in one, just look. In fact, let me, hey, if you're a community group leader, at the end of the service today, just come stand up here at the front so everybody not in a community group can look, and then they'll look up and be like, oh, they're in a community group. They kind of look like my age. I'll go to that one. Or they'll be like, they're not my age. That's why I want to go to that one, all right? Pick a community group, get in it, all right? Let me pray. Lord, thank you for this day where we can just relax together and see what it means for us to be disciples of Jesus and to trust you and your word in our life. You are good, you are faithful, you are wise. We love you, we trust you, you are our king. We pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. We want to begin this year by celebrating the Lord's Supper together. And so this morning when you came in, Lord willing, you grabbed off of this uh, table out there um, the little pre-packeted bread and wine, all right? This is for uh, safety reasons. We're not passing things around in our church. And so I want you to take this this morning, and I want you to hold on to it, and I'm going to ask you to stand, and I want to remind you of the significance of this. On the night that the Lord was betrayed... That was on a Thursday night. We call that Monday Thursday. On that night, Jesus was betrayed. He was betrayed by his, one of his closest friends, one of the, the 12 men that were the closest to him in his life. And on the heels of being betrayed, he didn't cower in a corner somewhere. Instead, he just went in faithfulness straight to the cross. That's what obedience to the Lord looks like. Even when you're betrayed and you emotionally don't feel like obeying the Lord, you do it anyway. And so Jesus was betrayed on that night. And on the night that he was betrayed, before that happened, he took bread and he broke it and he said to his disciples, this is my body and it's for you. It is for you. And then later that night, he took the cup after they had eaten supper and he lifted the cup and he said, this cup, this wine is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for you. And so Jesus was saying to his disciples that when you see the bread and when you see the wine, you are seeing the representation of what I'm doing for you, which I am giving myself for you. My body and my blood is given for you. And then from that point forward, for the next 2,000 years, right up till today, the church has remembered what the Lord has done for us in giving his life for us by celebrating the Lord's Supper. And when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, there's something that is amazing about it because the elements themselves, the bread and the wine, they draw our attention back to what Christ has done. The second thing they do is, is by taking in the elements, nothing magical happens. There's not a a sacramental element to this. Instead, what takes place is, is that as we take it in, we too are reminding ourselves symbolically that we take Christ into ourselves. That's why when I said earlier that our bodies are members of Christ, our bodies are with Christ. We are in Christ. And so what we do with our bodies, we are doing with Christ. And the third thing that happens when we take this is, as 1 Corinthians says, we do this until he returns, which means that our doing this 2,000 years later is a way of saying to the world, you know, Christ is going to return. And until he returns, we're going to do this. And every time we do it, we're going to keep reminding you. We're going to keep reminding the world that Christ is returning. And so we do this this morning in defiance of the tyranny of Satan. And in a a tremendous proclamation to the forces of evil in the world that there is one Lord, his name is Jesus, and we lift the cup in his name and we hail him as our king. And so this morning, we take the Lord's Supper in remembrance of Christ who has given his all for us and who will come and deliver all of us in him one day. Let's pray together. Father, 
This morning I ask that you would bless the, the word that has been taught. I pray that you would bless our time together in singing as we receive the Lord's Supper, the bread and the wine, as they touch our mouths, as they touch our lips and our tongues. May we be reminded that Christ is real, that his presence to us is real. We belong to him and that, Lord, our lives are secure in him forever. We thank you, Jesus, for dying for our sins, and we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you indwell us as believers, inhabiting us in our bodies as your temple. We praise you and we thank you for all of your goodness, God, our Father, who is also revealed to us forever in the person of Christ the Son and through the Holy Spirit. In this wonderful Trinitarian's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Receive the Lord's Supper.